Thank you for tuning in today and watching our video archive or live stream, however you're getting it in your living room or wherever you may be around the world. We're so glad that you're watching today. and We hope that you're sensing the presence of God. We really desire to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're believing God to touch you in a very, very special way as you watch this video today. So may God's word touch your heart. And we just pray that after you're done watching that you would take time and look through our website and see what all we have to offer. And if you're ever in the Silver Spring area, we invite you to come and be a part of us in our sanctuary and our services. So may God bless you. We want to take you to a service right now. Be blessed. Today. This is living now. to spend the next few days eating turkey in all forms of ways, but, you know, it's hard to believe that we're already into December next Saturday. Isn't that something? I want to encourage those of you this morning, or you've been waiting on the Lord uh, for something, and you know, sometimes when the year winds down, we kind of say, well, you know, it didn't, didn't happen the way I thought it would, but... You know, the year is winding down, but how many of you know God is not winding down? Amen? Amen. God is still at work. Amen? And there's so much that God can do, even in the days uh, that are ahead. You know, God is not guided by our calendar, and He's not limited by days and months. So I just want to encourage those of you, that you've been waiting, you've been believing God for something to happen this year. It's not over. Amen? <laughs> God can still do amazing things. Well, the message today is entitled, In His Hands. In His Hands. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. And we are reading from verse 1. And it says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. Verse 3, so I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. Amen. Amen. The profession of a potter and the history of pottery goes back a very, very long time. We know that archaeologists today will find pottery that dates back thousands and thousands of years. They'll be able to look at the different shapes and colors and designs and give us an idea of the period of time that those pieces were made in. And so Jeremiah receives a word from God, and that word is to go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. The first thing we need to understand is with God, there's always a message. Now, we don't always get the message, but there's always a message. And notice it says, my message. It's not just some random word, but there's something very specific that God has for Jeremiah. There's something that he wants Jeremiah to see. He wants to reveal something of himself to Jeremiah. So he says, go down to the potter's house. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are we, are we hearing the message? You see, I don't believe that God is hiding from us. I believe that God's desire is to reveal himself to us. He has a purpose and a plan for each life. Remember, this is the same Jeremiah that God said in chapter 1, before you were born, I knew you and I had a plan for you. I said to you a few weeks ago, standing here, that if God has us here,
here at this particular period in time, then he has something for us to do. And if this is where he's led us, then he also has a message for us. And so the challenge for us is to make sure that we hear the message that God has for us in any particular period of time. There's something that God wants us to take from every experience. Whether it's been a good experience or not so good experience, God has something that he's speaking to us in every moment. And there's something of himself that he desires to reveal to us. Not a random word, but a specific message that he has for Jeremiah. Remember Moses, he was going about doing his particular duties. And then all of a sudden he saw a bush that was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And so he stopped what he was doing and he began to walk over to the bush. And as he was approaching, God began to speak to him. You see, Moses had to step out of what he was doing and approach in order to hear the word of the Lord. And when you think of the the busyness that comes with our schedules and the busyness, especially at this particular period of time, we need to make sure that we're stopping and we're taking time to hear what the Lord has for us. All day long we hear people speaking. The scripture says there are many voices and they all seem to have significance. But have we heard his voice? As we seek direction for the next steps of our lives individually and as living word, as we seek the Lord's direction for what our next steps are, are we hearing the voice of the Lord? Are we hearing his voice as a church? Are we hearing his voice in our homes, in our businesses, in our uh, studies, whatever it may be? Are you hearing the Lord's voice? Not my voice, not somebody else's voice, but his voice. We know the story of Elijah when there was that earthquake and the wind and fire, and the scripture said that God was not in any of that. After all those things, there was the still, small voice of the Lord. And I challenge each one of us today that we take time in our, out of our schedules each day to spend time with the Lord and to hear that still, small voice. So Jeremiah responded in obedience. The scripture says he went down to the potter's house and he saw the potter working at the wheel. The key is that when God speaks, we must obey. Amen? Amen. So Jeremiah went down, and he saw the potter working at the wheel. The work of a potter is a very detailed work. I remember when I was in eighth grade, I was doing pottery in art class. Uh, I made something that was supposed to be a bird. (laughs) It didn't actually turn out that way. If you look very closely, you might see some sort of a bird image. It may be a little abstract. I don't know, but... The work of a potter is a very detailed work. It takes time. It takes a lot of patience. And it's no mistake that God would choose to reveal himself to Jeremiah as a potter. This word and this whole chapter, as we know, is a prophetic word to the nation of Israel. And as we know in the scripture, as we read, that much time and patience was required in working with his people. And much time and patience is required in working with you and with me. How do we know this? Because the pot that Jeremiah saw being shaped from the clay was marred in the hands of the potter. If you haven't figured it out already, he is the potter and we are the clay. As Jeremiah was seeing the work that was being done, the clay was marred in the potter's hands. Now, the word mar is not a word that we hear at all these days. I don't know if anybody's ever used that word with me. But it means damaged or spoiled to a certain extent. Damaged or spoiled to a certain extent. In other words, it's not garbage. It can still be used, but it's not the best that it can be. If you've ever been on a vacation... You were excited to go, and when you get there, it rained the whole time. You could say, that vacation was Mars. <laughs> Amen. It was still a vacation, but it wasn't the best that it could be. The word marred also means to render less than perfect, 
less attractive, less useful. To render less than perfect, less attractive, less useful. It's interesting how a piece of marred clay can sound very much like the way we see ourselves sometimes. Has anybody in here ever felt less than perfect? (laughs) Less attractive or less useful? You see, the clay was not ruined by the potter. I need to make that clear. The scripture doesn't tell us that it was ruined by the potter. It was ruined by the imperfections of the clay. You see, a potter deals in clay, and clay is a very earthy substance. It comes from the ground. And a potter's job is to look at that earthy piece of clay and to see the potential in it and to see what he can do by forming and fashioning it into a finished product. And the work of the human potter is very much like the work of God. While the potter was working with the clay, it got spoiled in the hands of the potter. The clay was damaged. The clay was rendered less than perfect, less attractive, and less useful. As the potter was working to mold and shape, defects began to be revealed. And you know, I was thinking that, you know, sometimes as God is working in us, we begin to see areas of our lives that need a little more work. You know, we talk sometimes about drawing closer to God, and I don't even know God is light. (laughs) But the closer you draw to light, the more you see things. Amen? And so the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked ways within me. Think about that for a moment. The Holy Spirit, the flashlight of God, searching our hearts to see if there's anything going on within us that shouldn't be. Can I tell you that sometimes life can be messy? How many of you know that life can be messy sometimes? And in the context, of this verse, people were wanting to go their own way. So sin can make life messy. Hurt and pain can make life messy. When we're not living the way we should be, it can make life a little bit messy. And when we're not living to our full potential, it can make life a little messy. We love God and we love him with all our hearts, but sometimes we are marred. While the potter was at work, something went wrong. And I believe that I'm speaking to someone this morning who's sitting here saying something is wrong. Something's not all that it should be. You are not alone. The scripture says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us can point to a moment in life when something went wrong. And consider a man by the name of Abraham. He had a promise that he would have a son. But a period of time would go by and he would begin to realize that it wasn't happening the way he thought it should happen. And so between he and his wife, the plan was devised that they would have a son with the wife's servant. How many of you know that's Mars? Amen. That wasn't the plan of God. And then think of a man by the name of David. He's the king of Israel and he's so successful in his accomplishments. But one day he sees a woman by the name of Bathsheba, and he decides that he wants to be with her. He ends up getting her pregnant, and then he puts her husband on the front line of the battles, knowing that he would be killed. Even David had a life that was marred. If you are not in a right relationship with God today, you are marred. If you are seeking the approval of man and not the approval of God, you are marred. If you are living in guilt and condemnation from past sins, you are marred. You see, none of these things make us disposable, but they just make us less useful. You see, how could we bring freedom when we're not free? Amen. And how can we give hope when we have no hope? But the good news is the potter is not finished yet. Amen. Hallelujah. He wasn't done with this piece of clay, and he's not done with you and with me. God has a plan. And the scripture says the good work he started in us, he is able to complete. And I don't want you to miss what's right in front of us today in the scripture this morning. The clay was marred in the hands of the potter. The clay was damaged. 
The clay was spoiled. The clay was messy. But the clay was still in his hands. Hallelujah. The clay was still in his hands. And that's the place that we need to be. When life gets messy and when you feel less useful, when you feel damaged, and when you feel spoiled, stay in his hands. Hallelujah. And what does the Bible say about God's hands? You could write these scripture references down. Psalm 138.8. It says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Hallelujah. There's a prayer you could pray every morning. Amen. Lord, do not abandon the works of your hands. And then Isaiah 49, 16. You could just write these down because I'm going to kind of go through them quickly. Isaiah 49, 16. Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Oh, thank you, Lord. Think of something you have. That is engraved. God said, I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. And then Isaiah 64, 8. Yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Isaiah 64, 8. Amen. Amen. See, not only is he the potter, but he is our father. And he says that we are the work of his hand. And then look at this one in John chapter 10, 29. Jesus is speaking here and he says this. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one could snatch them out of my father's hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No matter what the enemy is doing, no one can snatch you out of the father's hand. Amen. Glory to God. And in 1 Peter 5 and 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. See, I believe that scripture takes on a different meaning when you think of it in terms of the potter and the clay. Many times when I read that verse about humbling myself, you almost picture God's hand and you're below it. But picture for a moment, the humbling is that God is forming you and fashioning you. And we're allowing him to do that. Amen. You see, so many times when life beats us down, we walk away from God. But I want to tell you something today. Things will not always work out the way we plan. But when they don't, and as hard as life gets, we need to stay in his hands. When life disappoints you and it seems that God is nowhere to be found, we need to stay in his hands. Because he is the one who is holding on to us. You see, God is a master potter, and he knows how to take that earthy, messy, marred clay and make something beautiful. You know, in the life of Joseph, it's a very interesting picture of a plan that doesn't seem to go well in the beginning. The scripture says that because Jacob had hit so late in life, he loved Joseph more than all his other sons. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him, and we, we call it the coat of many colors. But his brothers saw this favoritism, and they, they hated Joseph because of it. And one night, Joseph had a dream. And the Bible tells us that once he had this dream, he, he shared it with his brothers, and they hated him all the more. He says, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, and suddenly my sheaf stood up right while your sheaves gathered around mine and they, they bowed down to it. I don't even know his brothers didn't like that dream too well. Amen. Do you intend to rule over us, they said? And to make matters more interesting, he had another dream. And he told his brothers that one too. And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me, he said. In other words, not just you, my brothers, are going to bow down to me, but so are you, mom and dad. This enraged his brothers, and so this triggered something, and it began a journey that would turn Joseph's life totally upside down. When his brothers left one day to graze the flocks, 
His father said to go and see if all is well with your brothers. And so they didn't realize, or he didn't realize at the time, that his brothers were actually plotting to kill him. His brother Reuben, his older brother Reuben said, well, let's just throw him in this well. But Reuben was thinking, actually, that he would go back for him a little later. But what happened instead is that they stripped him of his robe, and they threw Joseph into the well. In their next move, they would sell Joseph into slavery, and he would be taken to Egypt. They would dip his robe in blood and bring it back to his father, trying to convince him that Joseph had died. Joseph would be sold again in Egypt to a man by the name of Potiphar. You see, what's the point here? Here was a man by the name of Joseph who I believe was on the potter's wheel. You see, God had a plan for his life, and now that plan was seemingly marred. Joseph will find favor in part of his home, but one day he would be falsely accused of trying to take advantage of Potiphar's wife. And he was thrown then into prison. And when you read the story of Joseph, it almost seems unfair. Every time it looked like he was getting ahead, something knocked him back down. You know, we know the end of the story. We could read the story in about 15 minutes or so, but Joseph didn't know that. When he was walking through it. You know, we don't know the end of our story either as you're walking through it. But God knows. Amen? But God knows. And I love this verse in Genesis 39, 20. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. With everything that he was going through, I believe that Joseph was still in the hands of the potter. God was not finished with him. He was still in the potter's hands. I declare to you today that the Lord is with us. And he is showing kindness and he is granting favor. We just need to receive it today. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Whatever it is you're walking through, I want you to know that he's showing kindness and he's granting us favor today. Whatever it is you're walking through, we are still in his hands. There is no crack. There is no damage. There is no hurt that he cannot heal and repair. His hands are healing hands. His hands are delivering hands. His hands are restoring hands. Another opportunity would come where, in prison, Joseph would interpret the dream of two other prisoners. And he did so successfully. He told the king's cupbearer, please remember me before Pharaoh. But once again, the Bible tells us that the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. And two full years would pass again before Joseph would have the opportunity to interpret Pharaoh's dream. You know, we serve a very patient patient God. The Lord gave Joseph the ability to do so. And as a result, Joseph would be promoted to the second highest position in the land. Hallelujah. It is a powerful story and a message in and of itself. But that dream that Joseph had at the beginning, those dreams would eventually be realized. But here's the thing. Joseph's whole journey His whole journey was seemingly marred at every single point. He was thrown into the well by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He was lied on by Potiphar's wife. He was thrown into prison. He was forgotten in prison. From the time Joseph first had his dream to the time of its fulfillment was about 14 to 22 years that Joseph had to go through what he went through. It was about 13, 14 years to the fulfillment of the first dream, and then about another nine to the fulfillment of the second. See, it's not the way we would have mapped this journey. If we were writing the story of Joseph, we might have written it differently. And many of us, the journey that we have taken in our life, we would have written it differently too. But I want you to know that God has a plan. The master potter is at work in each and every one of our lives. Joseph would make the statement that we all love, that what the enemy meant for evil, God has turned it for good. Hallelujah. The potter was 
did a miraculous work in Joseph's life. And he became the man that God wanted him to be. Hallelujah. As we continue to read in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 4, it says, But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot. The potter formed it into another pot. You will not be thrown aside. His desire is not to discard us. When we stay in his hands, as damaged and as spoiled as we are, the potter begins to form us and fashion us all over again. I declare to you today that God is a good God, and he has a great plan for your life. You are not useless today, but you are useful. God is going to take that mess, and he's going to use it to make you the man, use it to make you the woman that he's called you to be. Hallelujah. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God as it seemed best to him. You see, we need to let God have his way. We need to let God have his way in our lives. We must trust the hands of the potter. I don't know if you've ever walked through something and you just allowed God to take control and it turned out better than you thought it would. Amen. Oh, how many of you can relate to that this morning? But sometimes we get it all wrong. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. And we're reading from verse 16. This is Isaiah now speaking to the same group of people. He said, you turn things upside down. As if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? We turn things around all the time. We turn things upside down. We think the one who is being formed can say to the one who's forming it, you don't know what you're doing. May we repent today, amen, and let God have his way. You turn things around. You see, the reason why we struggle so much is that we resist the process of the potter. We resist his molding in our lives. It is time to let go and let God have his way. It is time to trust what he is doing in our lives. We're not always going to understand what the potter is doing in us. And as a church, we're not always going to understand what he's doing in our midst. Many times it's not going to make sense. You know, Joseph's journey, when you think about it, it really doesn't make sense. You know, other people won't always understand either what God is doing in us. How many of you know that today? We must yield to the potter. You see, the clay is dependent on the potter and not the other way around. He sees our potential, and he knows the vessel that he wants us to be. During my late teen years, uh, I was part of a church in Toronto, Canada, where I was born. And uh, this particular church, we co-hosted a conference, a prophetic conference in Jamaica every year. So um, it worked out for my younger brother and I to be able to go to this particular conference. I was probably about 18 or 19 at the time, and he's two years younger than, than I am. So on the day of departure, we are packing and getting everything ready, and my brother realized in that moment that he couldn't find his passport. And so we started scrambling around. As you could imagine, this was probably a few hours before the flight. We frantically looked all over the house. We couldn't find it anywhere. Now, you have to remember the time period this was in. We eventually called the airline, and they explained to us that we didn't need a passport. And all he had to do was bring two pieces of ID, and he could fly. Now, remember, this was back in the time when there were less restrictions on airline travel. Amen. (laughs) 
Oh boy, times have changed. <laughs> so we got to the airport, we boarded the flight, no problem. We had a great week at the conference in Kingston, Jamaica. And after the conference, the church group uh, had arranged that we would, we would travel and we'd take a few days out of the city and into the country and we'd enjoy Jamaica a little bit. But my brother and I, along with another pastor friend who, who was one of the pastors who was on the trip as well, we had to leave a couple days earlier to get back because of other commitments. So um, the group uh, that we were with, the larger group that we were with, they, stayed, they, had to, they were staying a little bit longer. So they sent a car for us uh, to pick us up early to bring us back so we can board our flight the next day. Now you need to know something about Jamaica. There are some nice cars in Jamaica. And then there are others. <laughs> they sent for us one of the other cars. <laughs> uh, this car that they sent for us was not in good shape at all. I mean, it really, it looked like it was pieced together in someone's backyard. The driver assured us that it was safe. He, he, yeah, he made it. So he, he said, well, I made it here, so we'll be fine to get back. So reluctantly... Uh, the pastor we were with, my brother and I, we got in to return to Kingston and catch our flight the next day. But probably about midpoint during the ride, we started to notice that the driver was using his gear shift with a little more intensity. <laughs> and of course, they drive this side, so he's using this. Uh, so we asked, is everything was, was all right? His response to us was, uh, no brakes, man, no brakes. <laughs> Oh, boy. So here we are coming out of the hill country, <laughs> down roads that look like they were built for just one car um, with no brakes. And we're coming, literally, we're coming down the hill, and you can't even see other vehicles. Many of you know what I'm talking about. You can't even see other vehicles that are coming around the bend. They, they just kind of, you know, pop their horns. There's no guardrails anywhere because they don't believe in that. And we have no brakes. I turned to look at the, the pastor. I turned to look at the pastor that was, that was with us. And once he heard there was no brakes, I don't think he spoke another word of English for the rest of the trip. <laughs> I turned to look at him. He just started breaking out into tongues. He spoke for tongues the whole rest of the way. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. If you've never spoken in tongues before, I know exactly where it would happen. Amen. As we're coming back down out of the hill country, this car was literally falling apart before our eyes. I mean, the driver had to stop a few, a few times to reconnect something here and tie something there. <laughs> This was a two-hour journey that turned into three to four hours. We arrived in Kingston, Jamaica, literally, I'm not kidding, we were literally dragging pieces of the car behind us. The muffler was dragging, you can literally hear it as we're pulling in, in into the city. <laughs> so after a night of rest and uh, giving thanks, of course. <laughs> oh, man. We went to the airport the next morning. So, as expected, they asked my brother for his passport. And we explained what we were told in Canada about his two pieces of ID. And the officer there in Jamaica kindly told us, yes, that's true. You can get into Jamaica, but you can't get out. <laughs> oh, boy. You ever have a moment when you realize this is going to be a very long day? <laughs> so they, they said, well, see what you can do to get the matter resolved. Thinking that we were from there. I said, we're, we're not from here. We don't know anybody here. And they said, okay, okay, what we'll do is we'll pay for a cab and you can uh, taxi and you can take it to the Canadian Embassy and see if you can get it sorted out. Uh, so by now we knew we would miss our flight we got into the taxi thinking it was going to be a return trip with our suitcases and all. When we got to the Canadian Embassy, 
the driver took out our suitcases and he put them out into the street. And I said to him, I thought you were going to wait for us here. And he said to me, no, 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 one way, one way. So here we are in Jamaica, in the Kingston, in a place where we know nobody. The embassy wasn't open at the time, so we are literally standing outside the embassy in the middle of the street with our luggage. I want you to know by this point, hope was fading fast. This is not a time that weren't cell phones and all that kind of stuff like that, so there was no, no way to communicate with our, our group or even with my mother, who was, of course, waiting back home. My younger brother, he had totally lost hope. <laughs> I remember him saying to me at one point, it's okay, you can go home. <laughs> Just leave me here, is what he said to me. <laughs> I said to him, do you know what would happen to me if I arrived back at home without you? Amen. Do you know what my mom would do to me? <laughs> oh, boy. But this was truly a low point. And why am I sharing this story with you? Because sometimes life gets messy. You know, and we don't know what to do. And it's a smaller picture of a bigger picture. The clay was marred in the hands of the potter. And this trip was marred. But I want you to know something. We were still in his hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the embassy was on the second floor of a building. And on the first floor of that building, there was a bank. And as my brother and I are standing outside this building, a lady walks out of the bank. Now hear me. This wasn't just any lady. Remember now, we have no way of contacting anyone from our church we can't contact anybody at home. We don't know anybody in Jamaica. But the lady who walked out of the bank was the lady who was the main organizer of the church conference. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. She actually worked in that bank, and she was working in the bank at that specific time. She looked outside, and she recognized us. I want you to know that only God can do that. Oh, hallelujah. Only God can do that. And she said, what are you doing here? We wonder the same thing. We explained to her the whole story. and She said, do not worry about anything. We're going to get this matter resolved. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. I looked it up this morning. Jamaica is about 40 200 square miles. That taxi could have put us in Jamaica anywhere at any particular time, but it just so happened, and we know it's by the will of God, that it dropped us in a place where God already had someone who would recognize us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, I don't know what you're walking through today, but God has a plan. Hallelujah. And for the next several hours, that lady stayed with us. When the Canadian embassy finally opened, we went upstairs. We, we got in touch with my mom. It was a very crazy day, let me tell you. My mom was on the phone threatening the Canadian embassy workers. <laughs> my brother was sitting on the floor still without hope. I was just trying to hold it all together. They told us it would be a minimum of three days at least before they could do anything. And remember, we had to get back for a certain appointment. We had to spend all the money that we had at the time. They told us that at the embassy, three days that you're going to have to wait, but I want you to know that God had another plan. So that lady stayed with us. She helped us through. She drove us to the airline ticket office. And we came to find out this, that the, the reason why we couldn't fly that day was because our flight from Toronto to Jamaica was a direct flight. But the flight that we were coming back was going to stop in Miami. And today, as well as way back then, you weren't getting into Miami without a passport. Amen. And so that was the reason. And so the American Airlines ticket agent was right here. The Air Canada ticket agent was right here. We walked in. We shared what was going on. The American Airlines agent talked to the Canadian, the Air Canada agent. They exchanged the tickets. They said, we'll look after it. 
they looked after it, and we were prepared to go on the next day. Amen? Amen. That lady paid for our hotel that night. She paid for our ride in a taxi to the airport the next morning. A good taxi, amen. (laughs) And we were home the next day. Hallelujah. 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 You see, no matter how messy it gets, no matter where you are, God sees you and he has a plan. A few months ago when I was teaching on the message, Three Vessels, I shared with you that in a large house there are many vessels, some for honorable purposes and some for less honorable. But if we remain in the hands of God, cleansing ourselves from all that is not of him, the Bible tells us that we will be vessels for noble purposes, made holy and useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. And that's the finished part that God sees. The good work he started in us, he desires to see it completed. You see, his call on us is to be containers of his glory. Not damaged, not spoiled, but useful. Maybe today you don't see the value in yourself anymore. You say something went wrong. Life has gotten messy and you no longer feel useful for the purposes of God. Or maybe life has beaten you down. And you ask yourself today, is there still a plan? For me, you know, some of us have gotten so used to brokenness, we are comfortable with things not going well. We accept brokenness as a way of life. We live each day with hurt and pain, depression and guilt. We believe that God can never use us again. And we cover it up hoping that others won't see. But I want you to know something today God sees. He sees that. In closing this morning, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, 10. And it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are his workmanship. I want to read what the Amplified Bible says about the same verse. It says, for we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, Spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. Hallelujah. We are his masterpiece. We are a work of art, and God has made us for good works. The question is, will we trust him? Do we trust the hands of the potter? Do we trust the hands of the one who is forming and fashioning us? Do we believe that God has good works in store for us and that he will bring them to completion? Maybe today you're sitting here thinking, I I don't understand what God is doing in my life. Or maybe you don't see the value anymore in yourself. You feel less than perfect, less attractive, less useful. You're walking through something right now and you can't see the end product. How will this end, you ask, and how will this turn out? The scripture says you are his work of art, that he has good paths for you to walk in. As clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in his hands. You know, I was asking myself the question yesterday. What if Joseph had not shared his dream with his brothers? What would his path have been a little different? Would the end result still still have been the same in his life? There are no easy answers for questions like that. 
Those questions are questions of deep theological issues. We can get lost trying to unravel the what-ifs in life, but we can simply trust the hands of the potter. You see, once the clay is molded into the desired shape, the potter puts it into the kiln. K-I-L-N. A modern kiln can heat from 1,800 to 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. It dries the clay and hardens the clay before it is painted and glazed. But it is in this process, however, that the clay gets its resilience. It is in this process that the clay gets its longevity. If you're walking through the fire today, know that it's only for a time. Hallelujah. You will come out better. You will come out stronger. You will come out knowing that there's no better place to be than in his hands. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Just for a few moments this morning, let's make our seat an altar. I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us as we surrender all today to the Master Potter. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just begin to worship him right where you stand. Thank you, Lord. You are the potter and we are the clay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just pray at your seat today. Just yield. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 
need prayer. You feel a little damaged. A little spoiled today. Bless you, son. I'm going to ask you to come today and just come into agreement that the potter will continue to have his work in your life. Amen. And if today you say, I don't need prayer, but I just want to come to this altar and surrender, then feel free to come and just kneel and just surrender to the potter. Let's believe God that the work he started in us, he will bring it to completion in each and every one of our lives. Hallelujah. So just come as the worship team leads us again. Hallelujah. Beautiful Lord. Just begin to come. Whatever it is you're going through today. Father, we just thank you today that you are the potter and we are the clay. Lord, we declare today that we trust you. We trust what you're doing in our hearts. We trust what you're doing in our lives. Father, we give ourselves fully over to you in full surrender this day. We ask, oh God, that you would have your way that you would make us and mold us, and then you would fill us and use us for your honor and for your glory. Lord, forgive us for getting in the way. 
Forgive us for flipping the script. Forgive us, God, for not knowing what it means to humble ourselves before you. Lord, I pray today that you would take these cracks, that you would take the damage, that you would take those today who are feeling less useless. You will take those who are feeling today unworthy. You will take those who are feeling today condemned and guilty. No, Lord, you would make them into the men and women that you've called them to be. We yield ourselves to you. We yield ourselves to your processes in our lives. And we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Let's sing that again. Take me. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week of yielding, amen, to the Lord Jesus. We bless you as you go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, we hope you've enjoyed watching today. We trust that God has ministered to you. We're praying that God will touch you and bless you and strengthen you and that he would have taken the word today that you've listened to and imparted it into your life in a very special way. Take time to look at our website and see the other things we have to offer, our upcoming events, other ministries that we're involved in, and also the time of our services. If you're ever in Silver Spring area, we invite you to come to a live service and you will never be the same. Once again, thanks for viewing. May God richly bless you.